Lo voy a quitar esto porque creo que va a haber mucho calor. Te ayudo. Me sentí te. Buonasera e benvenuti a tutti. È un grande piacere presentare stasera questa conversazione tra Ella Fontana Cisneros e Jesus Fuenmayor. Grazie mille per essere qua. Vorrei ricordare alcuni momenti della, della collezione Peggy Guggenheim che quest'anno celebra due anniversari. Prima di tutto 70 anni della prima musa realizzata da Peggy Guggenheim a Palazzo Venier di Leoni aprendo la sua casa al pubblico e anche i 40 anni della sua scomparsa, è venuto il 23 dicembre del 79. Dunque, in quest'anno di anniversario, di commemorazione speciale, abbiamo creato un programma di attività dal titolo La continuità di una visione, costruita attorno alla collezione permanente alla musa Peggy Guggenheim, l'ultima dogaressa che è aperta fino um, alla fine di gennaio, 27 gennaio se non mi sbaglio, e che vi invito naturalmente a visitare. E infatti in questo momento abbiamo circa il 75% della, della collezione in mostra, sia in Palazzo Venier, dei Leoni, sia nei, negli spazi espositivi. E credo che sia una bella occasione per capire sempre meglio il percorso di Peggy, non solo di vedere le opere che conosciamo bene, le opere astratte, cubiste, surrealiste, ma anche di capire meglio e di, sì, di, 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 di capire che Peggy ha continuato a collezionare uh, durante il suo soggiorno veneziano che ha durato 30 anni. Um, e, um, Dunque, in, tra le varie proposte di quest'anno in, intorno a questi anniversari, abbiamo organizzato un ciclo di incontri intitolato Le Visionarie, durante il quale alcuni collezionisti filantrope che, come Peggy, hanno fatto dell'arte la loro missione e si raccontano al pubblico veneziano. Um, dunque, come già anticipato, abbiamo stasera, ne sono molto orgogliosa e contenta, è la Fontana Cisneros, filantropa, imprenditrice e donna di affari. Ha iniziato a collezionare, e poi lei racconterà molto meglio di me, ma tanto per darvi due, due parole, ha iniziato a collezionare negli anni 70 e la sua collezione ha un profilo internazionale e tocca quattro principali aree di interesse. La scrazione geometrica latinoamericana, l'arte contemporanea internazionale dell'America Latina, le videoarte, la fotografia moderna e contemporanea e la la collezione oggi comprende più di 3.000 opere e non si ferma, anzi, per niente, se ho ben capito. Um, sono anche molto felice di dare il benvenuto a Jesus Fuenmayor, che è curatore con più di 35 anni di esperienza, 
Dal 2017 al 2019 è stato curatore di Living Structures, Artist Plural Experience, la quattordicesima biennale di Cuenca in Ecuador. In precedenza ha lavorato come curatore indipendente ed è stato inoltre direttore e curatore della Cisneros Fontanals Art Foundation a Miami, o il SIFO, dal 2012 al 2015, e direttore e curatore di Periferico Caracas dal 2005 al 2011. In Venezuela, il suo paese nativo, ha lavorato come curatore al Museo Alejandro Otero. Ella, Jesus, grazie mille. Muchas gracias. Ringrazio naturalmente l'Istituto Veneto di Scienze, Lettere e Arti per la loro ospitalità in questa bellissima sala. E come sempre devo dare, uh, offrire la mia gratitudine alla Fondazione Aral di Guinetti di Vaduz che rende possibile questo, questo nostro public program. Um, dunque, come dicevo prima, vi ricordo di visitare uh, tutti i giorni, salvo il martedì, il nostro giorno di chiusura della Fondazione, e ricordo a tutti i residenti di Venezia alla e alla della città metropolitana che il giovedì, per la durata della mostra, dunque fino al 27 di gennaio, avrete, avranno la possibilità di visitare gratuitamente il museo. Uh, ora basta, siete venuti ad ascoltare invece Ella e Gesù. Grazie del vostro ascolto e buona serata. E grazie ancora. Can you hear me? Um, my Italian is not good. Ella's Italian is very good, so we are going to do it in English. So sorry for that. Um, we we didn't uh, uh, prepare this uh, conversation too much. We know each other since a long time ago, and uh, we are very pleased that uh, Carol and the Peggy Guggenheim Foundation invited us to, to come here. Maybe I'm too close to the microphone? OK. There? Better, no? OK. So um, we, I know Ella since uh, 20 years ago, and we have done many things together, so we uh, thought that uh, uh, this, was, uh, this was going to be an opportunity to do like an uh, informal conversation, conversation. more yeah. like a casual yeah. type of conversation. And what we are bringing is uh, a, a, a presentation with some images that go across one, uh, the main uh, interest in, in uh, Ella's uh, collection. So she's... Uh, uh, she's not just a collector, she's also a philanthropist, as uh, Carlo said during her presentation. And uh, I think it's important for us to see some of those pieces that belong to Ella's collection, to see them in, the, in their context. So we are also going to be showing not just single, or, uh, sing, um, uh, single pieces, but we're going to be showing some of uh, the uh, pieces in, in the many different exhibitions that the Ella's collection has been presented. I don't know, Ella, how many shows have uh, your collection been in? Maybe 50, 60? 60, it's a, maybe it's a lot. I, don't, I really don't know, you know uh, many in this now, years. Now your space in Miami, the C4R space, it was closed down last, uh, last year, but during uh, 15 years, uh, you... More, uh, to 17, 17 years, 17 years. Um, every single year during the Art Basel uh, Art Fair in Miami, you will uh, present uh, a different vision of, uh, of your collection, yeah, like collection. Invi inviting different uh, curators. No, but le let's, uh, if you agree, let's talk uh, uh, from the beginning. How yeah. did you start uh, collecting? Well, I started collecting when I was very young. I, uh, when I was around uh, 20, well, when I was even younger than that, I wanted to be an artist. So I started uh, painting while I was in Cuba. I was born in Cuba and left for Venezuela when I was very young. And so after that, uh, it was kind of difficult for me to start collecting. I didn't have the money to do so, but uh, I was very interested also in everything that had to do with design and art. So. When I was 20, I created, a, together with a friend, a, a, an art gallery in Caracas. And we, had, uh, we started with all the uh, Venezuelan artists first, 
And then later on, we brought in some of the Latin American artists. Uh, I was with him for around four years. And then after four years, I got married and had children, and my life changed a little bit. We were traveling a lot, and I stopped the gallery, but then I started collecting. I started collecting slowly while I was traveling without knowing not too much about what I was doing. So I made a lot of mistakes, but of course that's uh, part of you know what we do when we start. No? So after a few years of uh, traveling and collecting, I, uh, I started first buying you know, the for sure thing, because when we're young and when you're starting, you don't want to make mistakes. So I started with the old masters from Mexico and from Latin America. And later on in life, uh, I, my, mm, my ideas started changing, no? That's a painting by Wilfredo Lam that, uh, that, that was that uh, was the beginning of your uh, collecting time. Well, so yeah, I would say that that uh, when I was, I, 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 I had a house in, I, uh, a place in Paris for 18 years, and when I started uh, going to Paris, uh, I had a, a very good friend, a Venezuelan friend, Milagro Maldonado. Mal Milagro was living in Paris, so she kept saying to me, you have to come to the fair, you know, the, the, the FIAC. And in the 80s, was very, it was a very big fair at that time. And so in the fair, you know, with, uh, with my friend, I started looking at buying certain things, and I bought this painting Yes, in the year, it was, I think, 1981, around there. I bought two paintings from Lan. And it was very funny because at that day, uh, I, I bought uh, a lot of things. At that time, in the 80s, to spend $100,000 was a lot of money. And I was with my husband, who didn't understand what, uh, what I was doing, so he kept telling me, OK, I think you've bought, bought enough, <laughs> and you should buy it more. <laughs> And so, but I did, uh, did something in that fear that really changed the way I was looking at art. And it was, yeah, that paint, that uh, piece. Uh, it was, I wanted to buy a Soto, but you know, Soto is a, was a Venezuelan yeah. artist. And I've seen a lot of his uh, work, but it had a lot of color. What I was looking at was something that was at that time what Soto was doing. So uh, uh, my friend said, you have to buy this painting that Soto, I saw Soto, and I, come with me. So I went with her, and uh, when I arrived in front of this painting, I said, this is not what I wanted to buy. I was like, and she said, no, but this is 1960, I think it was 62, 63, uh, and no, 61. 61. And, and uh, she insisted for me to wash the painting. So I stood up there, and. I started looking at it, and I couldn't understand all these wires, you know, going, you know, crazy, and and it really, it didn't make any sense at first to me. But there was a moment that something clicked inside of me and said, "There is something that I'm attracted to this, and I cannot really have anything to describe this." But as and I did a lot of that. I think I bought a lot of of the paintings that I bought and the, the works from the heart. You know, it's just something that I say, OK, this is what I want to have. And from there on, my whole view of where, what to acquire, what to do, changed completely. I was so attracted from there on uh, on the buying just abstraction. Anything that was abstraction was interested. I was very did, interested in. Did you buy so the, the Gunther Gerso at the same? Uh, no, I bought that a little bit after that. OK. But, there but those, mm. the, other, uh, the other one that you have, the Otero one, that was also something I bought. Uh, uh, it was interesting because the artist, I, haven't met, I hadn't met the artist, but his brother used to work for us in, the, in Pepsi Cola, where we had Pepsi. And he came to us and said, you know, to my husband, we need to help my, my brother. You know, he needs some money. And would you buy this piece? And as well as I said, I don't know about any, anything about art, but I was there. And I said, no, 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 we're going to buy this. And we had a little talk there. And I, I did buy it because I thought, 
the art field was very good, but I hadn't met it. Well, later on in life, I found that I, I loved what Otero was doing, and I bought a lot of his work that way. And that, that, now, that piece became, uh, after some years, the biggest sculpture in Venezuela. In Venezuela. <laughs> it, it became was like built a 40 meters high sculpture uh, that was installed in the south of the country. Yes, it was the like biggest. the maquette, mm -hmm. you know, of, of that uh, huge so sculpture. That, that was a, so that was the beginning that you, you will say it was the, uh, that you became a collector and would you start uh, create, uh, buying these uh, geometric uh, works from Latin, uh, by Latin American artists. And uh, I think um, uh, your collection has been exhibited many times. Uh, your uh, geometric uh, abstraction collection has been exhibited many times by different uh, curators. Uh, there was Juan Ledesma who did the uh, site of Latin American abstraction. abstraction. Then there was a, the Brazilian uh, uh, curator, what's his name, who did the, the uh, exhibition Ataide, in Atalide. Uh, he did a, a beautiful show in, in, Sao, in Paulo Sao Paulo and Rio. Years ago. Then we took it to Rio and, and to many so other cities in Brazil. So you, uh, I think it's a, a, a wonderful thing to work, as I have, a, I has been able to do with you, uh, with a collector that is so open to bring different uh, point of view into uh, what she's doing. And uh, in this case, uh, the the uh, subject of. Uh, uh, Juan Ledesma, who did this, uh, organized this exhibition, was uh, thinking of uh, the geometric uh, works uh, by Latin American artists as producing a, a specific type of space. That's why the, the, the exhibition was called Sites of Latin American Abstraction. So how the, how the work created space for himself, that was uh, what he was dealing with. And, then, and you can see, for example, here, that uh, piece by uh, Ligia Clark, Clark El Casulo, which is uh, one of the pieces, the last pieces that she did, because uh, she stopped uh, producing art objects in 1966-67. So this is one of the very last pieces she did. And, and uh, um, Ledesma incorporated the, that piece in the show, or also this uh, other work by Ledesma another Brazilian Korea. artist, um, Valdemar Cordeiro, which is uh, like a, the radical opposite of uh, Ligia Clark in, the, in terms of uh, mm -hmm. the history of, of Brazil. Uh, Valdemar Cordeiro represents uh, uh, neo -concrete, uh, the concrete artist from Sao Paulo, and Ligia, Ligia Clark is uh, representing the neo concrete neo movement from mm -hmm. uh, Rio de Janeiro. Mm -hmm. So he, uh, Juan Ledesma put that piece in this context with a, the, uh, in relation to other works that also explore rationality. In, but in for example, you see there, there is photography next to the Waldemar Cordero. In 2003, I, w I had collected a lot of photography and I was just thinking, how come we don't have any photography from the 50s, the 60s, you know? Where are the photographers of that time in Latin America? What were they doing? And so we started a research into finding what was happening with them. And of course, they had most of them were dead. The families had kept, you know, the the um, uh, negatives. Some others not. I made a huge mistake. I should have bought all the negatives. But I, what I did was I I told them that they should print it, print, you know. Uh, uh, an edition, and I bought, you know, all the silver prints and all the uh, gelatin and the vintage uh, work that they had, and I bought like 350 or 80 uh, photographies, and I I spoke with uh, with um, Ledesma. Ledesma at that time, and I said, look, Ledesma, and he was fascinated by the idea, and so we, for the first time, we introduced all the photography from the the modernist. Uh, times of Latin America for the first time to the public. After that, uh, um, the Tate, all of the museums started calling me, where did you get this? Uh, they, they were not so sure they wanted to collect because I had bought all the, all the vintage and all the <laughs> uh, silver prints, but uh, I, I did give uh, the, the, the Tate a lot of, of these photographies, and later on I, I heard Tania Barzon at, at, a, at a conference say thanks to you know, a, a collector who did give us 
uh, a lot of these uh, photography we we now have them so and and if there is something that you that you said that I really like Ella is that a collection is something that changes with the times and uh, I, when you see uh, Ella's collection uh, that, uh, as is being curated one by one person or another it takes a uh, different shapes and uh, you can see in this case uh, this was uh, Carmen Herrera that was also part of a uh, uh, Ledesma show, but then it was shown as part of the Adios Utopia, which uh, which was uh, uh, I I think is the biggest art show ever organized on Cuban art in the U.S. Uh, it was uh, presented at the Museum of Fine Arts. It was uh, Gerardo Mosquera, René Francisco, yes. and Elcita Vega. Elcita Vega. They were the, the curators. three curators of the show, and there was uh, a section of. Uh, Cuban geometric art from the 1950s, yeah. and there was this uh, also this piece by Carmen Herrera was there, which is a, in a very different kind of uh, context. It was a, uh, here; it was part of a, uh, like in the context of uh, art, uh, op art in the La Desma show, and here is part of a Cuban 1950s geometric art. And then you have, of course, Ella, and that's something that I uh, I was um, uh, going to ask you. There is a uh, beyond whatever we as curators have to say about your show, there is something that connects uh, your works. What would you say that is the connection in, uh, in, in this kind of works, for example? In the well, in my case, I think that uh, when I see this work, when, when, uh, you know, when I bought this or what I, you know, I see Carmen Herrera, you can see the eye of what I like and what I am attracted to. And uh, uh, through the years, the, the, the curators have come to, to us to make exhibitions. They say that it has been an easy task to do the exhibitions because you can see that there is a very a strict look at some of the parts of the collection because of my eye, because I have been, uh, for me, collecting is more than collecting. It's a process, it's a, it's a process for learning and to learn and to, to go into all of this that I have, I, I can say, I can look back that says that, you know, it's fine and it's wonderful to have the pieces, but what I keep is what I have learned and what I have gone through collecting, which is the most important part. Uh, when I see this, I see, you know, Carmen Herrera. Carmen Herrera has been someone that I have been uh, guiding uh, his first steps. Uh, when I, uh, Carmen was 89, somebody called me and said, there is a lady, Cuban lady, who has, uh, who's doing a lot of beautiful uh, concrete art. And I thought, well, you know, maybe, they didn't say how old she was. And I thought, well, this is a young girl trying to do, you know, something concrete art. So I went finally to the gallery and they showed me, I said, well, how, low, how old is this girl, this woman? And uh, they said, well, she's 89. I said, what? And so you're telling me that all of these pieces are from, the, from what time? From the 50s, from the 60s. So I couldn't believe it. And she had never had an exhibition in her life. Because being a woman in America, and also Latin, was kind of difficult for her to find any galleries who wanted to really do a show for her. So I, I told her, I'm going to give you a first show. And I did, uh, we had, a, at that time, we had another space called uh, MAC. I have some images. Maybe uh, you have but some. But we have to go ahead a little bit, yeah. if you don't mind. And uh, I, I, this was a Kunstalin that I, I created in Miami in the year 2000, 2001, yeah. 2000. And, uh, and I took, you know, uh, I called my director at that time and said, Rina, you have to go there. And please be sure that we have a film of this artist because she might die, and if she dies, we're you know we're, we don't have the so the whole story. And we did. We sent you know a crew, and we did the first uh, video. But it was very funny uh, because Carmen is now 104 last year, so she really you know <laughs> did give me a. And okay. then then after that, I I gave work to the Tate. We did the show. We gave things to the Tate, and I started, you know, promoting her and helping her, and today, thanks God, she has been so lucky as to have wonderful 
uh, exhibition. She had just had a, a retrospective at the at the Whitney Museum and uh, in many museums in Europe, in, in Germany. So, you know, those those are the things also that I really like sometimes, you know, to find artists and to find things that are not so obvious, you know. Yeah, that you, you tell me if you want to uh, get out of a script. It's just, it's just no, no, uh, go, a way go better. Back, go back to where you were. No problem. <laughs> this Sorry. Is, uh, no, Sorry. no. It's. Uh, uh, I, th I think it was good to to talk first about your collection of uh, geometric abstraction from La from Latin America because it's uh, it's like a, like like the uh, uh, pillars of your collection, it right? Is. It, it is the most important from, uh, from there. part of the collection, and, I guess. And you have a, an, an amazing collection, yes. which is, we, we still don't know what is going to happen with that, but we can talk about that uh, at the end. Um, so we, you have uh, uh, pieces by, a, a fantastic uh, painting by Joaquin Torres Garcia, 1930 piece, uh, and then you have uh, uh, Mira Schendel, which is a, a great uh, Brazilian artist, which you have like uh, how many? Twenty-five pieces. Like Mira twenty-five, Schindel. thirty pieces from Mi Mira Schendel. Because that's very important for you, not just to collect. Uh, no. Uh, tra transversally, but also, also in, in, in yeah, yeah. 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 You, you want to go deep into every yes. every artist. Like Ligia Clark is also very well also represented. Also, a lot of Ligia Clark in the collection. Gego, you have like thirty Gego, fantastic I have like pieces. Eighteen pieces, like yeah. And for example, in Cuba, the same thing I did uh, with Carmen. I, I arrived in Cuba in, the, in 2009, around 2009, and someone told me that there were a group of abstract painters very important in the 50s in Cuba, and also uh, concrete artists. Mm -hmm. So I went to the museum, and I started looking at all these paintings who were fantastic, in which Carmen also was part of it, because she left. Uh, in the year, I think, 38, to New York, because she got married and, and moved to New York. But she continued the, 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 the uh, contact with all the artists in Cuba. And she, in 1951, I think, she came back for a big exhibition also in Cuba, where she told me people will go in, look at the exhibition, and close the door immediately leave. She said, I, we ne I never sold anything there. So it was very interesting. And so, uh, looking at all these uh, artists, I started collecting them and I started uh, m making exhibitions and including the Cubans also in those exhibitions. I did a book that is here now if anyone ever wants to take a look at them. And uh, after that, after I, that's something that I've been collecting a lot, mm -hmm. Cuban art, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I bought, you know, like 50 paintings from all these artists, 50 paintings from I don't know if we, you have we, them. We, we have some of the uh, works them, by the you know, uh, Cuban geometric artists in your collection, and, yeah? And so Lolo Soldevilla just had an exhibition uh, in New York at the gallery, at uh, Sean Kelly's gallery. And uh, and so I, I really like to go deep into, when I see an artist that I like, you that's know, that's Lolo Soldevilla. I go and I, I collect them, you know, all through. So I might have maybe 47 Tololo Soldevillas. And uh, that's all Lolo. And then you also have a This is Sandu Darie. Sandu Darie, I have like 50 paintings from Sandu and works and sculpture. And you were no. there at the very beginning because uh, no they were completely yeah, forgotten, they, no? They, 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 nobody knew about them. Mm -hmm. Now, now they, they are, but at that time they were not. And and that's part, I think, of what I really like, you know, because the process of learning also requires that research and that, you know, uh, that look into things that, you know, are not the obvious or are not right there in your, in your face, but that are still very good and, and kept uh, like a good secret, no? Yeah, and I, and I think you, you, en you enjoy a lot of uh, the possibility of uh, Creating uh, different connections yourself inside of the uh, of the collection. For example, you were mentioning the uh, 1940s, 1950s uh, modernist uh, photographers from uh, Latin America. You have uh, people like uh, uh, Leo Matisse, Stern, uh, Teixeira, Cabone, Herman Lorca, etc. There are some uh, images. Or Coppola. Coppola. 
but uh, you at the same time that you were uh, putting together this uh, uh, collection from uh, historical photographers from Latin America, then you were also putting together some uh, uh, a, a collection of photography uh, of a contemporary photography, photography. and you have uh, fantastic pieces as part of this collection. There's m there is Mel Melanie Smith yes. or Ed Ruscha or Thomas uh, Struth. The, the Thomas Struth, the even, even the, the, the Beckers also is in, in the collection. So uh, wha what m made you do that uh, connection between the uh, Latin American historical photography and contemporary photography? Because it's not, it's not a connection that nobody else no. was I doing. I think uh, I was very influenced by my partner at that time. He was a photographer. And, uh, and I was very interested in photography, but I never knew in reality you know, that it was social media, you know, a new media that I could be very interested. And I don't know why, and, and because I go deep into that, there were like a y few years, maybe eight years, that I wasn't buying anything, no sculpture, no painting, just photography, photography, photography. I went into, into that. And, uh, and not only the geometrical photography, but also all the Germans. I was very interested in, in understanding what the Germans were doing photography. And and also my interest is is also architecture, a lot of architecture. So there's a lot of photography in the collection that. Uh, has I to do I with don't that. want to sound uh, pretentious, but I think that that you have a very particular eye to uh, a unique way of uh, uh, relating to space. If you see, for example, this uh, show that was done. In Brazil, let me see if I found it has to be here. Uh, here, that that's the one. That's mm -hmm. uh, uh, that was another presentation of your, your uh, geometric art collection, uh, and it's it was uh, articulated around Gustavo Pérez Monzón. Monzón, and this is uh, an amazing installation made out of uh, threads and stones. No, yeah, he did that originally in the eighties. He was an artist that in the eighties really changed in Cuba the way that the Cubans were doing art. There was a, uh, an exhibition called Volumen Uno, and that, uh, uh, that, ex that exhibition really changed the way they were doing art. They started, uh, the artists started thinking that they didn't want to do what the government wanted them to do, but that they wanted to be open and even do things that they have never done before. And he, he was one of those artists. And in the 80s, because uh, mm, lots of the exhibitions that they did in Cuba were closed at that time because they were representing things that were against the government, etc. Uh, they, they closed a lot of exhibitions. So the artists uh, did a final exit. They did a, 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 a performance called uh, uh, El Juego de Pelota. So they all mm. got together, you know, with, uh, with the, the baseball critics. Game, really. It's a baseball game. Mm -hmm. And they all got together and, you know, with rock and roll and it was prohibited in Cuba. And, well, that ended very bad. And the government really said no more of this. So there was a big move. All of the, these artists leave, left Cuba to Mexico mostly. And uh, in, he was one of those artists who left to, to Mexico. He stayed in Mexico, one of the few, because most of the other artists n did not receive a, permits to stay and work in Mexico. So they left Mexico through the frontier to go to the United States. But he was one of those who really had uh, the permit. And he decided to stop working in 1990. Mm -hmm. And in uh, a few years ago, like five, four or five years ago, I found his work in Cuba. And I started collecting it because I thought he was fantastic. And then later on, went to meet him in Mexico, talked to him, and said, you know, I want to buy everything that you have. And uh, he, he looked at me and said, this is somebody's crazy. <laughs> yes, because I'm going to give you an exhibition. and I'm going to also make a book. And uh, well, at there, the there end, is a book. the book is here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I did buy like 100 paintings from him and uh, did the book, did an exhibition. The first exhibition I did was in, uh, in Cuba at the museum. The museum gave us a full floor, which was never heard, because they, they never do that. But it was a fantastic exhibition. 
It was lots of success, and after that, he decided to come back and started do work again. So mm, then we continue bringing this. Uh, we opened another museum in Mexico with this exhibition, and then later on we took him to Brazil. So now he's producing a lot of work, and he's a fantastic artist. You, 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 you can do things like that. Like uh, you can, you, you are yeah. uh, doing things like looking into geometric car through this installation of uh, Gustavo Perez Monzon. I don't think that is very common. Like uh, that is uh, like you you have this uh, a way of relating to space that I think is very provocative. No, that you you like to to see. Uh, like different tensions, different dynamics within the, the works. And that's why you can uh, have he, a collection that produces this kind of... Uh, you know, he of did this, this, this first thing he did, this, this first installation he did in 1981 with thread, because they didn't have, in Cuba they didn't have the materials, so he took, you know, there, he told me there were these uh, socks that the Russians were selling in Cuba, and he pulled the, the, the threads of the stock because they were elastic to do the to do this installation, so he did it with the thread of the stock, and he hanged up all the little you know pieces of of, of stones that he found on the beach, and it was a small installation. So when I met him, I said, "I want you to do this with the right materials and to do it in a large scale, like I, as you thought you wanted to do." And so he did this, it was fantastic, and we took it, this was the exhibition in Brazil. And it was such a success because, like you say, mm. everything, you know, you were looking at the art through this wonderful uh, and big uh, sculpture installation. That was really, this is the exhibition. It was, because the exhibition also integrated lots of, of uh, artists, uh, young artists who uses, because the, uh, geometric abstraction is uh, is the roots of Latin American w art, so there are a lot of of artists who uses that in their work of today. So that was interesting. And there there is a Gunter Gerso. Yeah, in, uh, Gunter in the Gerso. collection since forty years ago. Forty years, it's right there. Yeah, you're right. So um, there is uh, something that uh, I don't think uh, in Italy is taken so well. <laughs> the the Fontana w uh, in the, in the context of a Latin American uh, show. So here Fontana is seen as an Argentinian. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, he so was born in Argentina, even though his parents were Italian. So, so I and I, and I, li and I, li and I like that that comparison is fantastic. Remember all of these different way of uh, cutting the space. You know Fontana, Nelson Lehner with the zippers. Uh, Nidia Clark with a folding, uh, mm -hmm. fold with the beaches are folding uh, sculptures that you can move around. So there is all these uh, works are has a very particular uh, way uh, of uh, relating to space. That's uh, Carmen Herrera, but there was a Which Carmen. One? No, no, that. Uh -huh. That is Andu Darius. Andu Darius is Cuban, one of the artists that we just uh, were talking about, and he did this in wood before Ligia Clark was doing in, in Brazil the bichos in metal. And he didn't have the, the, the materials, but this was meant to, uh, to do the same thing that mm -hmm. the bichos did. Bichos were made for people to handle and to work with and change the, the format, etc. And uh, Sandu Darie did it in, this is around the 50s, 1955. Yeah, 55, 56. And uh, Ligia did the vicious in si the 60s. In the early 60s. In yeah. the early 60s. So uh, they, this is what was happening, for example, in Cuba. And they were not really at that moment connected. Although Sandu Darie later on, was co or earlier on, was connected to the Madi movement in Argentina. And he was part of the Madi movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, he was uh, ahead of times. Ahead of time. And then uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't want to uh, interrupt you. I, I, I know there are many ideas. The collection is so it go, uh, it's, it's so rich. It has uh, so many different la layers, yeah. and and it goes in, in many in many directions. But I think it's important to uh, explore a little bit uh, uh, your contemporary Latin American art collection. 
And this is a show that uh, I was still with you at the foundation in Miami when uh, this show was organized by the Museum of Fine Arts in, in Boston, Boston, which is a, a, a venerable institution in the States, maybe the second biggest institution after the Metropolitan in, in New York. Uh, and they was uh, the they decided to organize the f their first Latin American art uh, exhibition ever with uh, Ella's collection. And uh, uh, their Jim Mergel was the head of a the, the, the head of a contemporary art, and Liz Mansell were the both. the ones uh, mm -hmm. organizing the show. The show. And and, the, the, and here you have. Uh, uh, amazing pieces, no, by yeah. young Latin American, yes. well, the next generation yes, of sure. uh, Latin American artists. Would you like to talk about uh, Yes, Lehner, and behind that is Rene, Rene Francisco, that's in the 90s and, and 2000, and then you have Maracapana the, at the back, 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 and that's 2005, probably, and Neto, just in the front, a, a Brazilian artist, and that's probably also 2005. Would you, would you say, Ella, that uh, the, the connection that you have with the younger generation of artists uh, in Latin America, is uh, it has something to do with the uh, grants? Because uh, it's the Cisneros Fontanara Foundation in Miami has uh, a program since 20 years ago that gives uh, grants, production grants to artists. And uh, there has been like uh, already 120, 140 40. artists from uh -huh. Latin America that uh, in the last 20 years has gotten the grant. And it's right now in New York, like last week, yeah. uh, you just opened at the Museo del Barrio the uh, show of the 2019, uh, 2019. Uh, uh, grants. Uh, uh, Exhibition. Yeah. Because we, we not, not only give them, you know, the grants, but we also give them an exhibition. And for 17 years, we did this at the art space in Miami. But two years ago, we decided that because uh, our mission is to really promote the arts for you know the artists all around the globe, Miami was a, a s small place for them for this. So we decided to iterate uh, uh, the works and do the exhibition each year in a different place. So we did the first year, two years ago. It's going to be two, almost two years, no? in uh, Quito first, two years. two years, Quito, and then we did with uh, uh, Jesus uh, an exhibition also of the grants uh, in Cuenca, during the Biennale in Cuenca, in also in Ecuador. And we did another exhibition for the grants in uh, Lima, Peru. And this year, uh, the grants are have been now uh, on an exhibition in New York at the Museo del Barrio. But, uh, but uh, I think that uh, Every single artist in Latin America from that younger generation is represented in, in your collection. Like, uh, yes. uh, if you Saraceno think Saraceno was the first one, and today Saraceno is uh, all over the world. That was uh, the, the Saraceno and um, and Jarvas Lopez were our first prizes uh, when the 20 years ago they were, were very young. Right. I was just talking to him about that the other day because I found him and I said. I still have because he was crazy. He wanted to do these floating uh, uh, cities, so he made us do all you know, bring you know these huge gloves that we did in Key Biscayne at the beach, and inflate them with helium. And then he was jumping from one, one. The police came, and and <laughs> it was a disaster. <laughs> and the, the the firemen came. It was a, a big big. Uh, uh, thing that we did and, and we still have him. I said, told him the other day, you have to come and organize that. You know, he, he was 20 at that time, so. But it was, uh, so uh, you have a very complete map of uh, uh, the different generation of artists from, from Latin America in Brazil. You have uh, oh, the 90s, Ernesto Neto, we were seeing one of his work. You have Jack Lehner, you have Rivan Nauchanda. Uh, everyone, and then uh, you, you can say the same thing in, in every single country. country. That's uh, Colombia, one piece by, that's uh, Sergio Vega, mm -hmm. and uh, Major Weisman, Maracapana, uh, Maracapana, and uh, and uh, how it's I, I think it's uh, extremely important that the institutions in in the states are uh, able to do these kind of shows because 
of uh, what you have done. No, they 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 yeah, are taking advantage of you, uh, having been there for so many years, years. for twenty years, following what the artists are doing, and then they have uh, most of the uh, of the job done bef when <laughs> when yeah. they do the show. No, uh, all of all of these pieces are fantastic pieces mm -hmm. by great artists, and they can. Uh, they can they can do they can take this step forward and say okay yeah. this uh, you have the this uh, uh, great collection like uh, uh, I, d I don't know how many collections has the same uh, level with in, in Latin American contemporary art maybe three four of them has the same level and then they say okay these people are doing this uh, putting together all these uh, great artists let's go yeah, and, right. and support also, it. No? Uh, also my mm, my motto has always been that to lend everything everything should be for the public and and being shown so we we lend I don't know last year we had like 400 pieces lent to exhibitions to museums to many places so for us uh, and the and what I I did was I gave uh, the total, uh, uh, most of the works are at the hands of the foundation who manages that and is a, they are the ones who lend the pieces to so make the exhibitions and are constantly, you know, making the, the, the works go around, no? Right. Um, let's, let's go, let's move on into, uh, you, I remember that uh, last week when we, spoke about this presentation, you said, there is something that I want to talk about, Jesus, uh, all what, what uh, we did in uh, Miami, uh, in, uh, in the space that was called Miami Art Central, which was an amazing place in, in yeah. Miami. The best shows in Miami were, were being they? presented at Miami Art Central. And that was, uh, how long did it last, Miami Art Central? Well, no, we, d like four years, four years, and then after four years, the, the city of Miami uh, asked me, because I was on the board of the museum, of Miami Art Museum, they asked me if I could uh, be, uh, try to merge with them, because their program was quite uh, not so good, and <laughs> we were having much more people. So what we did is we merged the, what we were doing at the MAC with MAM at that time and move all the our programming. We move it to to MAM to mm -hmm. the museum. So, so for example, this uh, there was an amazing show. I remember seeing uh -huh. the show of uh, the history of video the art of video. organized by the Pompidou, the Pompidou. and they have and amazing works too. by this uh, uh, Nanjun Pike, Nanjun the Moon, Pike. or Bruce Nauman pieces that you have never seen in Miami. So it was very important for uh, this uh, uh, contemporary art community that was just beginning to uh, open, to, yeah, yeah. to move to, into yeah, something else uh, and see this kind of uh, historical shows in, in Miami Art Central. Uh, Peter Campus, which is one of the most important figures, or of video art or Tony Ausler from the 80s, Stan Douglas, all of those pieces, one single exhibition in Miami was amazing. Or Pierre Huy, or yeah. and then and then Tassi you did, uh, did the show of Tassi that was all, and another show at Miami Art Central, okay. Tassi mm -hmm. Tadin was everything was filmed, so it was a super complicated uh, exhibi exhibition to organize. It was no no video. It's well, no, we did also. I don't know if you remember 2000 or what we did a William Camry show there. Mm -hmm. who was bigger than the show that they placed in MoMA, and we brought it to, to Miami. We had it in Mac in 2001, more or less. And then you also did uh, the, the Carmen Herrera, Herrera show, show that we already... Ana uh, Maria Mayolino, that was one of my favorite. I gave her her first exhibition in Miami. Ana Maria is now a uh, wonderful... Well, she has been a wonderful artist. And, and it was uh, an amazing now, show. Yeah. And I know she did a big exhibition also in Los Angeles. And uh, you also did, uh, well, you did Chantal Ackerman at the, at the museum. At the uh, museum. Yeah, that mm -hmm. was part of that collaboration between, collaboration the, between the MAC and the museum. Of, and, and this is this is a piece that uh, it's uh, in your collection, That's in which my collection. is, I think, this, uh, the most important work by Chantal Ackerman. Chantal. De este. Um, and... Uh, you also mentioned that was that, that you also told me that you wanted to 
to speak a little bit about your uh, interest in, in video in general and how you yes. create a collection of video. Can you tell us about yeah. that? Uh, we, we have a, a collection of video, maybe around 500 videos. Uh, the videos came really as, as part of what the artists were doing and using. So I was interested first in the artists and what they were doing. And because I was interested in them, I started to look at the, at the other media they were using, and one of them was video. So in reality, I wasn't drawn to it in video as per se, but through the artist, I became then interested in video. And of course, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's what it is. It's the most important, one of the most important media for the artist today. When uh, when artists at, uh, at the time when you start collecting really video, Francesca Woodman was not very well known. No, at all. And uh, you and had I, I went to see the the show at at, at I, I think it was Marianne Goodman who was doing it. Marianne Goodman. And yeah. they had the the videos of her, but she these were filmed when she was fifteen, and so they were only showing that as a part of what you know the show, trying to show them what she really did, and I said, you know, these are too good. I want to have the film. And they said, but they're not for sale. I said, well, then you have to make a, some sort of, of uh, edition because I want to buy the films, and they were, then I bought the films, and they, they eventually did make the edition to, to and, sell. Uh, I, I, we had a very nice experience in, in, in other spaces in Sao Paulo, you remember, that we, we put together this show that went first to the mm. to La Habana, to Central Lam, the, Ovidio, me the video. Memorias de la Obsolescencia. Yeah. And uh, it was a selection of all the uh, videos that, that are in the in the collection. So then... Uh, that was the B William Kendrick show that we... And we, uh, we have a... The collection has a lot of... Tell, tell us a little bit about your relation with uh, Cuba, Ella. You, you, went, you went there in 2000... Uh, 12? No, I, I started uh, going to, some, well, I, I've, I've been going to Cuba since the 80s. I was born in Cuba, left when I was 13 to Venezuela, stayed there, and then we were banned to come back. So I, I, I didn't go to Cuba for 20-something years, and then eventually in the 80s, because my, my, one of my brother stayed in Cuba, I went back to see him in Cuba. Always very sad at the beginning because of just you know, my, my memories of the, of the country were completely different to what I found when I came back. But then I was interested in, the, in what was doing, the, they were doing in art in Cuba, but I did, at first, in the 80s, I, I couldn't find anything that really attracted me. But then, in, during the 90s, I, I, I started, you know, looking at uh, some artists like Los Carpinteros, which, you know, when they were coming out of school, uh, I started collecting them, and and I did uh, buy some of the of the artists, Cuban artists. But later on, in 2009, I came back with the idea of really bringing the Cuban artists into the foundation, into the awards, because up till then, Cuban artists were not really uh, considered, or they're not considered. They were not part of it because they had no internet. They had no way of connecting to our system, which was mostly digital. So I started going there to see how I could, you know, make that link. And eventually, slowly, I- Shaking, I, shaking, I, shaking I, the, the yeah, institutions I started and going then the, in 2010, uh, the museum, uh, the director of the museum asked me if I would bring the collection to the museum in Cuba. And I was very shocked because I had never seen, you know, the government asking us who were outsiders. We were Cubans in exile, and they didn't want us around, you know, we, because we were representing the opposite of the, what they were teaching. But I said, okay, I will bring the collection. And of course, in Miami, everybody was telling me, don't do that. You know, they're going to take your collection away. And I said, no, 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 no. I, I kept talking to the people and the artists, and they were so happy because they were studying. <laughs> they didn't even have books. They were studying with photo. They were taking photographs of the books. There was somebody came with a book, art book, and they would take photography, and they would pass the photography 
around <laughs> and that's how they were learning. So for me to bring all of these uh, artists to Cuba for them was like, I've never seen, they there asked was, me. There bring was even a small gallery dedicated to Ana Mendieta, remember? Yeah, because they asked me, bring Ana Mendieta. Ana Mendieta was a Cuban artist living in, in they, the, they, they don't, they, and they, they didn't they know they the, work. They, the work. They, they, and I said, I don't want to bring Cuban artists because I think, you know, you want to see something new. I'm going to bring, you know, I brought the Ai Weiwei, I brought uh, Nanjun Paik, I brought Neto, uh, pieces, all the... Uh, Pistoletto. The Pistoletto, uh, things that were, for I thought that for them were something new and different, but they asked me, please bring Ana Mendieta because we don't know anything about her. We haven't seen the work. So I did bring some of the Cuban artists from... from the back, the, but the it was Amaino, such a success. The Damaino was in the in the Cuba show. No, no, okay. no. The so Damaino was, uh, was in the Cuba uh, show. That I was my mistake. But Jorge Pardo was. Uh -huh. Joseph Casu and Joseph Casu and, and, and so all Barbara Kruger. None so of this art has been seen in in, in, in Cuba. Cuba. So I I did that. It was such a success. Uh, it was supposed to end in July, at the beginning of July, because I was afraid that you know the. There is uh, the hurricane season, and it starts like around uh, August. So I said, I want my p pieces out of there before something happens because it's difficult, you know, for them. They, they're without electricity and this and that. But there were so many people coming from the interior. People were coming in buses from uh, different parts of the of the of the island just to see the show. That they asked me if I would uh, reconsider and and leave the work. Uh, one more month, and I did. I, I, I left the work all the way to starting of September. And of course, and they told me never in Havana Vieja, never the electricity never goes out <laughs> because everything is, you know, under, it's not uh, out underground. It's underground, so nothing's going to happen. And of course, the electricity <laughs> went out, <laughs> and we were without electricity one week, and I almost died. And we had, you know, running back and forth to try to bring, you know, uh, it was a drama. Uh, it was a drama. Yeah. But then, you know, finally, they fixed the problem, and and it was okay. And then but you did the opposite. Then you th then you decided to take Cuban art to the United States, right. which is not even which is not easier. Because in the year two thousand, around two thousand eleven, I, I was talking to a group of, of artists in one of the galleries, and uh, they they wanted to know about the foundation, what I was doing. So I talked to them, and they say, you know what? Nobody has done an, an exhibition of what we have been doing in Cuba in the last fifty years, forty years, and why don't you give us this? this space, please do an exhibition. We need that. So I said, okay, I will do, but I'm doing this exhibition now. Let me you know, finish this, and I promise that as soon as I finish this, I will start. And in 2013, we started the, all the research and to put together this wonderful exhibition who was called Adios Utopia. And uh, we brought it to the United States. Uh, it went to the Houston Museum, the of fine arts in Houston, Walker. and it went to the Walker Art Center also. It was going also to uh, Washington, to the Hitchhorn, and at the last minute we had uh, political problems. Washington didn't want uh, to have Cuban art, and uh, unfortunately, yeah. it did, the same thing happened to, it was coming to Miami. But it, it's good to have you around when you want to shake a little bit the institutions, <laughs> huh? <laughs> uh, yeah, and also the same thing in Miami. It was going to come to, to the Miami. Uh, even though that most of these artists and most of this art has to do with the time, there's a lot of, all of these are from the 80s, and the protest of all these artists against the communist uh, country and still, you know, Miami didn't, you know, they, they got afraid. They called me one day and they said, we're not going to bring the show because it will bring political problems to us in Miami. So we had to stop the show in Miami. But it was a fantastic show. And uh, we had all the artists from, you know, from the uh, concrete artists and the, and the abstraction, the abstract painters to 2004, Tania Burguera, the, uh, this is the 90s uh, that's generation. That's the 90s, now. yeah. And, and uh, Elso is going to have a lot of work from Elso Padilla, mm -hmm. who's going to have a show now in uh, 
probably in New York and in wow yeah amazing yeah that's another artist that I've collected a lot and nobody knows him but yeah that's I think los I'm carpinteros in, no, that's no, los carpinteros uh, René Francisco Rodríguez and Paul Juan that's uh, um, Wilfredo Prieto Wilfredo Prieto's flags it was a great show. And then you, this is um, the same show at show the Walker. At the Walker the, the Center. The other image was at the Mies mm -hmm. and the Building of the uh, Museum of Fine Arts right. in Houston. So um, I think we can uh, finish the, the, That's the, Elso. the conversation. This is Elso, yes. Uh, asking you, what are you planning to do with your collection? So you have this, uh, <laughs> this is. Uh, uh. You have, uh, for example, the artists uh, from Cuba of the 1980s, oh all yeah. of them, uh, Cuenca, Elso, uh, Sa Saavedra, Tonel, René Francisco, Toirac. Um, yes, most of that, those works were works from the 80s because I, as I saw that the museum had not collected those works because of the problem of it was when you know they were closing all these exhibitions and most of the works have to do with you know uh, the artists protesting against what the government was doing. I started collecting them, thinking that one day those works will have to come back to Cuba. So what I did uh, is uh, I think I I've bought like 500 and something pieces from not only from the 80s also from from before and a little after that. And uh, my idea is that one day that will go back to Cuba if, if the, if it can go to Cuba because right now I don't think you know, there's no money, there's no organization, but one day maybe you know. So my I I I, I think that you've seen in the papers, I had come to an agreement with the muse with the government of Spain, to do an ex uh, to do a. a um, a museum of Latin American art uh, at in Madrid, and that they've given in two two and a half years ago we signed an agreement, a pre-agreement. Uh, it was a little too fast probably to sign that pre-agreement, but mm -hmm. the government wanted to do you know the announcement and so forth and so on. We did, but for the last two and a half years we've been waiting for the government to first to have a government because they haven't had they have had I think we've had in Spain like three or four. Ex uh, elections and and uh, they've changed the minister three, three times already and uh, and the budgets have not been approved and finally I spoke to them six months ago and said I will let you I would wait till December to see what happens and we're still waiting we'll see what happens from there on but the, I I'm, I'm sure by the by the size by the kind of collection that you have uh, that the collection is going to uh, end up in, in, uh, in may maybe not in one single institution maybe the that's problem is maybe maybe you have an idea like to create like a s an entity I don't know how to call it like a fund or a foundation I don't know well, no, that, that were several institutions who uh, yeah. uh, get the works on loan from so it's not that you are donating the collection to one single museum and then the, the, the collection is exactly in the storage yes. and nobody can see it, but you have the collection yeah. in, uh, in a way that can be uh, shared by different institutions, which I think is very smart. You know, I've been in so many boards of so many museums and uh, what I've seen is that the, the biggest museum, they grow, grow, they have lots of work, but the public doesn't really get to see not even one-tenth of what they have. And so I thought, I've collected all this year. Of course, what I, you know, if uh, when I when I would go away, I would take with me with what I have learned. But I think that the public needs to see those things. And uh, and see if I like Peggy Guggenheim for so many years, she did collect, and her eye is you can see it there at the museum. That's what I I was always saying. If I have for so many years done this collection, it should stay together in, in some ways. Or at least, I've, I've, of course, I have three daughters, and I, they want to inherit something. And I said, OK. But I, the, yeah, 
that's for sure. But part of that, I want that to go to the public. And it's very rare. I, I try what you were saying. I've been trying to talk to museums and see if we can do like a, a, a fund in which you know various museum has access to this. But it's very difficult. All the museums want the works for them. I said, but what are you going to do with them? Put them back into a warehouse. You know, all my life I've been lending my work to, to everyone, you know, for exhibitions, for everything. I don't want to leave work and then, you know, let them keep them away. For that reason, I give it to somebody or I give it to my children, let them sell it, do anything, and that will go back to the public, but not in a warehouse. I wouldn't like to do that. And I have not been able to then take it. It's true, I have not been, to, till now I have not been able to find, you know, uh, uh, except for Spain, mm -hmm. except for Spain, who I hope, let's see what happens, uh, but if I, that happens. I'm but sure it's going to yeah, better, we'll see. To find the right home, yeah. the right place. We'll Thank see. you, Ella. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, if anyone it's, uh, wants to make yeah. any questions, mm -hmm. I'd be glad to answer the questions. There is a question back there. Okay. Hello. So thank you very much for your talk. It was really nice. And I watched an interview that is said uh, that it has been a low process for us as Latin America to be accepted in this artistic community. And I'm Brazilian. And in 2018 and 2019, here in Italy, there were more or less more than nine exhibitions focused on Brazilian artists, from Fundazione Prada with Laura Lima, Fundazione Carriera with Ligia Papi, and including the Guggenheim with Ligia Clark next year. Uh, but my question is, what do you think about, in a way, this segregation when we speak about Latin American art? Uh, when we're going to find a way to present our works and our artists beyond this geopolitical um, border, and referring to your, your exhibition, when are we going to finally have the permission to be global? Uh, well, I think that we are global now. I think that, <laughs> yeah, I think that uh, it's still a way to go, but we are far from when we started. 20 years ago, when, we start, when I started collecting Latin American art, it was rarely in any museum. And today, I think you can find that most of museums around the world are very interested in Latin American art, and there are exhibitions everywhere happening. Even to, uh, I've been talking to the Met, Metropolitan Museum, and never had any Latin American uh, work and now they have a department and they're starting to collect Latin America and I think it's happening, you know, it's happening. I always tell, you know, when they tell me about, of course, I'm Latin American and I, I, that's my heart and my roots are there, but I always tend to say that they are just artists. You belong to the artist community. You're not Brazilian, you're not Italian, you're not, you're part of that community, which is a worldwide community. And of course, we cannot, I cannot collect uh, work from all around the world. I tend to collect what I can touch and what I can see. You know, maybe there are fantastic works in, I don't know, in Romania, but I don't go to Romania that often, or I'm not so close to that part. And I, I think that same thing is happening with Latin America. You know, people who know about us or who know about more Latin America or are closer are starting more and more to have more exhibition. And of course, you will find people who have never been to Latin America and they're far away from, from our, our, our ideas and our, our, our way of thinking or, or doing art. But it's happening, it's happening. I think that we are in most museums right now and it's happening. I hope I answered your question. Uh, here. Uh, the gentleman wants to. Uh, uh, okay. Um, 
I'm very curious about the personality of the collector, uh, the, you as a collector. And at the end of your, in, of your, sp your speech, you talked about your daughters and the problems in the future and whatever. And my question is, were you able during the many years where you collected and you created an amazing, amazing collection, were you able to involve your daughters, your family into it, or it was a sort of a one girl show? That no, is no, 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 not at all. I have uh, my daughter, my younger daughter, Claudia, have been collecting for already Eight, 15, 18 years. She started with photography, now she's collecting everything, not only photography, but everything. Mariela collects uh, women artists mostly, and she is very much involved with the foundation. She's all the time involved with the artists in the foundation. And then later on, everybody, like my nieces and my everybody on the family, one, one way or another, are all connected to either collecting or part of the foundation or are part of all this. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay. Unless there are uh, one more question. No? Uh, oh, there, we have, there we is ha one back we there. Have, we have 15 minutes more. En español. En español, porque no me puedes ayudar. Sí, claro. Excusa, porque no hablo italiano ni inglés. <risa> eh, sabemos que, la, que toda la colección de ELA, que es enorme, eh, tiene todo un apego al, al arte cinético, al arte conceptual, pero que hay de todo en esa colección. ¿Cuáles serían los pilares morfológicos, sentimentales o, o digamos eh, políticos, quizás, para esta colección de los años 80, para esta, eh, vamos a decir, eh, selección? la curaduría de los 80 y si sabes si algún día los cubanos que vivimos en Cuba podremos tener la oportunidad de verla esas dos cosas okay. uh, do uh, yes she's asking about uh, she's Cuban and she's asking me about what uh, what was behind the idea behind me collecting all of these works from the 80s if, if there was Cuban art from, the Cuban art from the, those, that time if there was political or if there was anything else other than you know just the art itself and uh, if uh, if cuba will if this will always it will go to back to cuba to to be shown i think that uh, well for me i think that i collected those times the those mostly even though part of of what you know they did is not my my trend or what i usually collect but when you collect like me, when you go to a certain stage in which you uh, have a big collection, you're not, all, all, you're not only buying just because you like what you see, you're buying for other reasons. First of all, when I buy, certain things are because the collection needs it, because there are certain parts of the collection that need certain works. And in this case, there were things that I would never probably have collected just because it's, it's my taste. But I think it were, they were important, important for Cuba, important for part of what I was trying to tell with the, my Cuban collection. And that was a whole, it's a whole in the Cuban collections of, uh, you know, in the museum. So for me, I was thinking more on how to cover that stage for the later uh, generations to come, because we as Cuban, when the generations, you know, next generations come, they're going to find this hole that the Cuban have not. So there's a lot of other things involved in collecting, like in my case, you know, that I'm doing certain other things, not only because I want to or I like to, but because they are needed as a whole for the collection. And of course, we, if they let us, we'll bring them. Uh, thank you very much, Ella, for this very interesting uh, conversation. Um, I wanted to hear your thoughts, or at least your perception, on going things forward, the relationship between Latin America and Latin American art with the cultural landscape of the United States. Of course, the United States has been also very important for the development of Latin American art. I, for once, would argue that Miami is part of Latin America. Um, so, but given, you know, 
the current political situation in the United States. Um, how do you think that this relationship is going to evolve? Do you think that in the future, Latin America should try to, in a way, distance itself from the United States, focus more on itself? Or how does, let's say, for example, now, a more clear and established relationship that's going on between Latin America and Madrid, uh, you know, with the projects that you've just mentioned and La Tabacalera, going things forward, how does Latin America relate to these two uh, cultural landscapes? Well, I, I don't know, Mr. Trump might try to stop, you know, Latin America to come into, you know, uh, the United States. But there is a fact that is, is, is alive and is there, which is that we are 60 million people, Latin American people in the United States. And growing is the, the growest, fastest growing minority in the U.S., which means that probably we will be a majority one years. day. In 10, 15 years, we could be a majority. So I don't know how can that be stopped. A president can stop today this and say no more. But you know, the, re the, the world grows by itself, it's organic. So I don't think that uh, that is it's going to be more. I think it's going to, you, you're gonna see more Latin American art in the United States. And because our roots, you know, even the Latins that, that have been born as a second second generation in the United States, they all want to maintain the roots. So we're gonna see that that's gonna change in the next couple of years in the US. And in Madrid? Well, and in Madrid, um, Latin, Latin America, Latin I, Ma Madrid. Madrid is a different story because we're so close to the, to the culture in, in Spain that for us it's easy. And Latin Americans in Madrid are very, you know, are, there's a lot of Latin Americans living in Madrid and there's a lot, the Spanish people, I'm also Spanish. I'm Cuban and Venezuelan, but I'm Spanish too because my roots are, my grandparents were, were Spaniards. But uh, that's easy, that's, that it's naturally uh, a fit there with Spain. Yeah, uh, I had a question. Uh, in your mind, uh, is there a distinction between being a, being a collector and being a patron? And if so, uh, when you, in your experience, when you've come across work that you've liked or an artist whose works you've liked, how have you approached in terms of motivation or your involvement in terms of just collecting the work or also patronizing it? Is there, has there been a difference in your collecting mm -hmm. experience in terms of uh, being, I mean, collecting or being a patron? A, a patron. Yeah. Uh, as in patronizing somebody's art or a, a style what or... What is the difference between being a collector and being a sponsor? I think the, it depends because a collector, you can be a collector of anything. There's collector, uh, people who collect uh, stamps and uh, art and whatever. And uh, in, in, in my case, it's a different case. It's not the regular case. I, I'm much more involved with the artist and with what happened with the artist than, you know, and learning from them and participating with them in the process that is just acquiring and you know putting them in my my walls i don't have walls anymore to put my art so for me it's the most important thing i think is to be part of them to be part of what the artist is doing and what and their lives i'm i'm, I'm that's what i've been doing you know if i'm cuba i'm surrounded by artists and i'm helping them and helping them get to to the to the next level or to go to, to be accepted in exhibition. So um, I, I think a, a, a patron of the arts can be part of, of a collector also, if, if a collector intends to have that part, you know, develop. But a collector, you know, you can be a collector and still don't, don't you don't need to be a patron. You can be just a collector. No? Uh, have you have you always kept everything that you purchased that you acquired? Have I have to tell you, at the beginning, I was very much into surrealism, and I bought a lot of surrealist paintings. And then later on, when I started collecting abstraction, I decided that 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 didn't fit anymore into what I wanted. So I sold all of those very early, a long time ago. But then later on, we have a, pro a space problem and. <laughs> My registrars are always telling me, you need to promise that every year you're gonna sit down, analyze and look at the collection and try to get 
you know, read of because sometimes we buy things that later, when the time goes on, you look the at the whole collection and it doesn't really fit, you know, and, and so what we do is we try to clean, let's say, part of it. And, and I sell, let's say, maybe three, four paintings a year. In some years yeah. I don't sell anything. Even less than that. Sometimes less, two paintings. Yeah. And sometimes I give away, I like, you know, because right now my, 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 the people at the warehouse were crazy. They say, get rid of all the big pieces. We cannot, and so I gave away to the museums like five or six big, big pieces that I had. Because the warehouse doesn't stretch. <laughs> yeah, okay, two more questions. Um, I have a question and, and a comment, actually. Um, I'm a little bit surprised. I'm from this small country, Belgium, and I'm a little bit surprised as an art lover that uh, certain young people have, um, let's say, a worry about an identity of South America um, if they are given enough opportunities to come you know, out in the world, etc., And I think, just to answer to them a little bit, that I don't think it matters really where you're from, what you do, what, if, you, if you just believe in what you do, it doesn't matter. There will be more, luckily, more people like Ella, who has the great eye, <laughs> to discover people from maybe the region you were once from, but you are now a world person and there's many like, uh, like her that are, you know, and they need to be in the future and they are there, that will discover, you just need one good eye and if they believe in you and you believe in yourself, it doesn't matter where you're from actually. I was today in the Palazzo Fortuny and know Luc Tuymans from when he was young, he's a customer of mine, I just delivered furniture for him, but it's funny, He started, like, we're only 20 years back, and he was not known at all. And somebody believed him in, in him, like you did, and he got into the Tate, and now he's in the Palazzo Fortuny. So, and Belgium, compared to South America, has been reigned by Spain and the Netherlands and whatever. We never had a, a big identity in art. So, I mean, that's something I just was a little bit surprised that, that you'd be worried about it, because I don't think it's something you should be worried about. Um, if you're... A, If you believe in yourself, you'll make it. But, and, and somebody will, you know, you have to trust people like Ella and well, somebody will come by. So I, I was yeah, just a little bit amazed by that. Do you know something, something I want to touch here, which is very interesting. I was in a, in a panel in Madrid, you know, with other people and we were trying to discuss many things and they asked, you know, what, you know, is, what is the price, why the price of art or why You know, some, some works are so little and some so art. We are in a world in which art has become part of a, of, of a, a trade. It's, it's a commercial thing. Unfortunately, that's, that's the truth. And so it's not in our hands. I mean, for more than I, ca I can do for an artist and, and, you know, and, and help them and everything, The market is out there, and they are the ones, who, the gallerists, and certain people are the ones who really say, this is worth 100,000, or this is worth. Mm -hmm. And I was asking, well, what is the right price for art in reality? Because you go, you want to, to make an estimate on one of your paintings or something. If you go to Sotheby's, and you ask them for, uh, for or to Chris's or to any of these, uh, uh, people that, that can, can evaluate art, and you say, well, it's for insurance, they'll give you one price. And if you are going to sell the painting, that price is half of what they just said. And then if you go to the gallery, the gallery will tell you it's double what they just told you. So at the end, what is the price? What is the price for art? And I said, it's the price you want to pay. Yeah, it is. It's the it's only price. The, the price, price is what want somebody pay. wants to get for it. Exactly it's what it's the worth same for somebody. Thing with emerging artists, you know, mm -hmm. you can do many things, but you're still in the market and you're still in the hands of all these people who decide how much you're worth mm -hmm. and how much you, you can okay. do. I had one, I had a comment, but I also had a question to you, and it's a very delicate one because I am wondering now, there's a lot of young people here, way half my age, and I think. Um, 
when I read what the discussion was going to be about tonight, it was also about how do you start collecting art, and you explained how you started, but for me, when I look at the scene of how I just do, I tour, you know, in art, I give advice about art, but that's all I do. I don't own anything important, I would say, not worth mentioning, but the thing is, I, I follow you when you say you have to start when you buy what you like, what touches you, what you can, what you right. think I can stay in my living room and look at that piece for a whole evening and it's not going to bore me, that's what you need to buy. But this is actually what it was, I think, when you started and maybe when I, I'm already too late for that because... It's never too late. It feels, no, it's never too no. late, but it feels now a little bit more what you just said. It became a little bit a business. And also when you started, because you, I hear you had a gallery in, um, first, you had your own gallery. And then later, after you got married and, and children, you start buying. But you do need a certain, let's say, a start funds for that or something. Because how do you start these days? I mean, we're in an economy now as well for youngsters that it's very tough to even get jobs even sometimes yeah. so i think to start collecting is like it sometimes it, it feels like it's a different you know well I, i'm going to give you an example i can't recall the name of these people but there were two these two um do you remember this is a couple in the united states she he was a mailman and she was Vogels. And he was a mailman and she was a teacher. And they started collecting what they could buy, $100 per month or whatever. And they bought these drawings from these emerging artists that were taking place. This was 30 years, 40 years ago. Well, they, and they, right now, they had the most wonderful collection of the most important artists in the world of drawing. And they were so incredible that they gave the whole collection. They separated the collection in pieces, and they gave each um, um, state in the United States, each uh, museum in each state, part of the collection. They divided the whole collection and gave it away. But these people had no money, and still they did wonderful, a wonderful collection. Yeah. One family was paid to buy the work. And, the, and they saved the other to, to buy the work. It was fantastic. So I th and for them, I'm sure it is like what I was saying. It was the, the pleasure of the process more than the acquisition of, you know, the worth what it was worth for, you know. One more question. I think there is one question at the very end. Hey, good Hello. evening. Eh, voy a hablar en español para poder hacer bien la pregunta. Eh, okay. ¿Cuál usted cree que haya sido la, la influencia que tuvo su interés en, en estos artistas cubanos que usted mencionó de los 80 y de los 90 eh, que hacían este arte típico, este arte político? Eh, o sea, la influencia que tuvo su interés en ellos y, y usted... Eh, coleccionar su obra, para que ahora al, algunos de ellos sean eh, reconocidos en, en Cuba, e incluso se estudia en la escuela, por ejemplo, Lázaro Saavedra es Premio Nacional de Artes Plásticas. Eh, ¿Cree usted que su interés en, en, en ellos tuvo al, algo que ver en, en que sucediera esto? ¿Y cuál usted cree que es la diferencia en que artistas como Saavedra, eh, René Francisco, por ejemplo, sean reconocidos y otros como Tania Bruguera, por ejemplo, todavía eh, públicamente en la isla no son eh, aceptados, digamos. Bueno, eso es muy fácil. Um, he's asking about a special artist in Cuba, Tania Bruguera, which is a political, he, he does performance, political performance, and uh, René Francisco and Saavedra, who are two artists who are both pre uh, national awards of the arts in Cuba, and they are both have been uh, teachers in the in the uh, university in Cuba, and they are like the the most important artists in Cuba. Well, it's very very. <laughs> you have it right there. 
Tania is a political, he, she, her performance is all political and it's all against the government. So it's very difficult that the government is going to accept that. <clears throat> so every time she's done something, I, and I've talked to people on the government and I've said, you're, you're wrong what you're doing. They take their, her passport and then she, sometimes she, she does actions and as a matter of fact, one day she was doing an action and nobody knew she was doing this. So it was like, we were all surprised that suddenly the government came, took her passport away, took her to, to jail for one day. I said, you're, you're wrong because she's doing, she's an artist and she's doing what she thinks is good for her. But this won't change anything in Cuba or outside. If you take her passport and you fight her, this is going to give her uh, uh, newspapers but it's not going to solve the problem. She will continue doing the same, which she is. In the, in the other way, René Francisco and Saavedra, even though in the 80s they did a lot, and he still, Saavedra did a, a fund of many of the, of the government people, etc. they're still in Cuba, and they still work, and they are, uh, uh, they are recognized by the government as fantastic and very important artists in Cuba. So the 80s and what I collected from the 80s was because of my involvement with all of them, my involvement with the artists that are in Cuba right now living there, the emerging artists and the, and the most important artists. And through them I've learned and I've, I've seen what happened in the Cuban scene during you know, all these years. And I was, I was curious to see why they were not co being collected by the museum. There were very few pieces of art in the museum from that age. So my idea of being Cuban and being part of that community that I, uh, that I was seeing and, and working with them, I decided someone has to recuperate all of this work or else next generations of Cuban, when we have all gone past, are not going to see this part of, of, of our, our cultural status. So someone has to do it. I went and I did it like anybody, maybe some other people would have done it. But in Cuba, it's very difficult because there are no collectors in Cuba. So it's very difficult that in Cuba, any collector, there's no collectors. No one is go was going to do that. So I did it. That was my reason, not the only reason. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Gracias.